Well, it's good to be here. Uh, thanks to the Horizons team for inviting us down here. We'll briefly introduce ourselves. Um, uh, Matt Zorn, partner at Yetter Coleman, um, and uh, I, I filed lawsuits, which may be why I'm here, and also publish a newsletter um, on regulation uh, of, of these substances. It's called On Drugs. I don't know if you've read it. If you haven't, you should subscribe. Shane? So I'm Shane Pennington. Um, I'm a partner at Porter Wright Morris and Arthur in DC. I live in Beacon, New York. And in 20, what was it, 19, Matt came into my office when we were both at Yetter Coleman and got me into all of this. And I had no idea who he was or what was about to happen, but I've been sort of following, uh, you know, obscured in his shadow uh, ever since. So, so we have some slides that we're going to walk through about uh, FDA approval and what that means for the uh, the field and the regulatory implications, us being lawyers, so I would repeat Kevin's admonition at the beginning. Um, there's no medical advice that's in this uh, presentation because we're not doctors, we're lawyers. Um, so sorry, I was just still waiting for the slides to catch up. I'll, I'll just start with slide one, which is um, psychedelic drugs. Um, anyone know what a psychedelic is? <laughs> anyone like psychedelics? You guys know that they're not, they're, they're illegal. Um, okay, so, so, but psychedelics actually isn't a really illegal, there's no like psychedelic category of drugs. Um, a drug is, there's no psychedelic in the Controlled Substances Act, there's hallucinogen. Um, and, and I think what's important for today's discussion is that psychedelic drugs, um, with a few exceptions, are all in Schedule One. Um, and there are different definitions of psychedelics you could use just as a common matter, whether you know, some people consider ketamine to be a psychedelic, some people don't. You might uh, interpret it in terms of whether it agonizes the 5-HT2A receptor, which causes visual distortions. Um, but for the purposes of our discussion today, a psychedelic we can think of as the drugs in Schedule One that were put there in 1970 when the Controlled Substances Act was enacted. Um, and importantly, what, what for our discussion is that these drugs have no accepted medical use. I think there's a common misconception about the Controlled Substances Act, which is that Schedule I substances are more dangerous than Schedule V substances. That's not actually correct. What, what really it is, what, what the way it really works is, is if a drug has no accepted medical use and it has any potential for abuse, it goes in Schedule I. And that's how you have situations where LSD is in Schedule 1, but methamphetamine is in Schedule 2, methamphetamine has an accepted medical use. And that brings us to rescheduling. So the logical way you would reschedule a drug is you would show that the drug has an accepted medical use. And perhaps the easiest way, but not the only way, as Shane will comment, is to get FDA approval of the drug. If the FDA approves the drug, it has an accepted medical use. And Today, the Controlled Substances Act has a way to automatically, essentially reschedule, although I had a discussion out there. I want to be very clear about what this type of rescheduling is. It's not the drug class that gets moved, right? It's the drug product that gets moved. So there's, ni there's a 90-day clock from the moment that FDA approves the drug or sends a recommendation to HHS, and that removes the drug product from Schedule 1. This is called bifurcated rescheduling. It's where the FDA approves a drug product. That drug product is then carved out of the drug class and moved to a lower schedule. Meanwhile, the rest of the drug class is left behind. There are a couple instances of this in the Controlled Substances Act. We have that with uh, synthetic THC. There's a drug called Syndros. It's all it is is synthetic THC that's approved by the FDA. We have GHB, um, Xyrem. It's a drug that makes jazz pharmaceuticals a lot of money. Um, but it's just basically GHB. Um, GHB is in Schedule 1. Xyrem is in Schedule 3. That was done legislatively by Congress. So, and, and, and why that's of import today is many expect that MDMA, when it goes through the approval process, that there's going to be bifurcated rescheduling. That means the FDA-approved product is going to be moved to Schedule 2, 3, 4, 5. We don't know which one. And the rest of the class, which would be MDMA writ large, um, would be left behind. And why is that important? Well, there are a number of different important implications of it, but the one I'll leave everyone in the audience with is 
research doesn't get easier on MDMA, it gets easier on the FDA approved product because that's the only thing that's getting removed from uh, Schedule 1. So MDMA writ large is still going to be left behind in Schedule 1, still going to have all the same Schedule 1 barriers and so on and so forth. Shane? Okay, well, my, what I'm looking at is very different from what's up here, so... <laughs> Could you all just come over here Y'all can and... do the presentation for us now. <laughs> all right, um, well then I'll just look like this. So Shane, you're, you're here. Okay. <laughs> okay, that looks familiar. All right, yeah, so when, a, when FDA approves a drug and it's resched, rescheduled or scheduled, I guess you could say, since the point that Matt's making, right, is that it's not like the psilocy, you know, if, if um, Comp 360 uh, were to be FDA approved and then rescheduled, it would actually be putting that formulation in a different schedule for the first time so in a way, you could say that it's actually just scheduling that drug, if that makes sense, because it wasn't, that formulation wasn't on the Controlled Substances Act lists before then. Um, in any event, when that happens, um, there's a, sort of a consequence for state law, because the states have their own Controlled Substances Acts, and those Controlled Substances Acts, many of them, I think it's more than half now, have triggering provisions. And those triggering provisions say that when a drug is rescheduled at the federal level, or scheduled, that the state then has to match that um, move under state law. So for example, if um, you know, Lycos's formulation of MDMA were to be FDA approved, and then move to a different schedule, then these state triggering laws would say, states, now you have to do the same thing. It's not automatic, however. Um, in fact, some states require legislation for it to happen. Others require administrative action, meaning a state regulatory agency has to take steps to you know, make that a reality. And you know, there are 50 states out there, and they all have different laws. They all have different agencies running the show in, in their, within their borders. And I've talked to some of them. Um, about this issue, and suffice to say, um, they, not all of them really know themselves exactly how this works, or you know what they need to do, or when it's going to happen, or really anything. And I don't say that to be critical. I just say that to um, kind of let everybody know that uh, this stuff is automatic, uh, in really hard quotes. So just to walk through, hopefully, yes an example of how this works. So let's take um, you know, prescription synthetic psilocybin. So say that psilocybin were FDA approved, and then it were moved to a different schedule. That formulation of, of psilocybin, which would be, you know, right now it looks like in most likelihood, if that were to happen, it would be a synthetic formulation. Um, it would be available by prescription. Um, and that would really be the only way that you could access it legally. Um, this would also open the door for insurance coverage of that formulation. Um, and I say open the door, I want to be clear about something. A lot of people think that it's legally required that you have rescheduling or federal legalization or some sort of triggering event for insurance to cover something by law. It's not a legal restraint. It's more that the insurance companies assess the risk themselves in their own way. And you know, you might not be surprised that uh, pharmaceutical companies' ability to profit is tied very tightly to what insurance companies uh, feel willing to cover. Um, and so then, along with all of this suite of changes, also you get um, tax benefits, access to banking, other things, because this is like now the legitimate formulation that can be marketed in interstate commerce once it's FDA approved, right? Now let's look at the other side. So what's left behind? So if a synthetic formulation of psilocybin were moved to, say, Schedule 3, all of those changes would happen for that formulation. The psilocybin in the mushrooms in your yard, or wherever, right, um, those would not be rescheduled. Those would remain in Schedule 1. Um, some states, as we all know, are starting to uh, remove restrictions at the state level on those uh, versions of the, of the substance. And so that creates a sort of uh, flexibility you know, kind of ironically, right, for those, for what's left in Schedule 1, because people are going to be accessing 
those substances through these state-regulated channels and um, just underground, right? And as the states move in one direction and the federal government moves in a different direction, all sorts of interesting and confusing and confounding things can start to happen. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, so are we there? Uh-huh. So one thing that's happened recently that you may have heard about, right, is that um, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, recommended that DEA move cannabis to Schedule 3, right? And it didn't, what's really important here is that they didn't just recommend, you know, moving one compound that a pharmaceutical company can profit off of, right? They recommended moving all cannabis, all of it, to Schedule 3, which would mean we would not have a bifurcated scheduling si situation there. That would mean the entire class of drug would be moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. That's one very important feature, uh, sort of historic. Uh, it's, it's a big deal, but it's a big deal in another way, too, because in order to do that, HHS updated uh, its standard for determining whether a substance has a currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States. As you'll recall from what Matt said, that's the line, that's the key finding that has to be made to get a substance out of Schedule 1 because that's the dividing line between Schedule One substances that don't have a currently accepted medical use on the one hand and all others that do. And so what HHS said is that if a substance is like cannabis, where it's being regulated at the state level and uh, doctors and healthcare providers are actually recommending it to patients in treatment in large enough numbers, and they didn't say exactly what those numbers are, but they said if enough of them are, um, and if there is some scientific support for the therapeutic effect of the substance for at least one indication, then that establishes a currently accepted medical use. And it was on that basis that, that cannabis moved. And so one important implication of this is that when, in, when the federal government does something, basically the government has to treat like cases alike. That's the bottom line. So if they did that for cannabis, they can't then just say that another substance that met the same standard, well, we're just not going to treat it that way, right? They, they have to treat like cases alike. And so this means that state laws regulating psychedelics take on a much greater potential importance. Because unlike the FDA approval pathway, which only removes the single compound, making it easier to research that one but no others, right? This, this new HHS blueprint of using the state law and regulation of a substance to justify rescheduling the entire class could move the entire class of a psychedelic substance out of Schedule 1 if it were, you know, possible to be shown that that would be, uh, that one of these other substances met the standard. Importantly, this isn't final yet. I'm sure, you know, I don't know if you keep up with all this news as much as I do, but right now we're still in that process, and um, for this to be final and, and real, you know, we need a final rule that becomes effective moving cannabis to Schedule 3. Uh. Okay, so I'll take off-label prescribing. So uh, one implication of FDA approval is that the, the drug becomes available for medical practice. And I think an important thing to understand is, so for instance, if FDA approves the MDMA product that is going through the approval process, that drug will be available not just for treatment-resistant PTSD, but it will be available for practically any indication. It can't be marketed for any indication by the drug sponsor. But doctors and therapists would have considerable flexibility to use the drug for other purposes, like, I guess, one of the ones is adjustment disorder. I don't know. There are plenty of, uh, plenty of MDs in the audience. So in any event, the, the point here is that FDA approval will unlock the use of these drugs, um, not just for whatever indication the FDA approves the drugs for, and then subject to a couple caveats that we'll get into. Um, Shane, do you want to take this one? Sure. So, so um, right. So in the clinical trials we've seen that have shown the promise of various psychedelics, um, it's always been so far that that promise is really shown uh, with assisted therapy, right? So it's, it's the use of the substance plus um, uh, some sort of psychotherapy component that really is where the, the effect is shown um, in these clinical trials. This raises some interesting questions, however, because um, FDA regulates drugs, it regulates dietary supplements, it regulates a lot of things, but psychotherapy ain't one of them. 
Uh, psychotherapy is something traditionally regulated by the states. And that's a really important distinction in the law, like what is the turf of the states versus what is the turf of the federal government. And one thing that really, you know, I think we get this idea that federal agencies, like a lot of people don't understand them, and they see them as sort of these monoliths that just sort of do whatever they want. In fact, they have really defined boundaries of what they can and can't do, right? So they have authority that comes from Congress that, you know, I, in theory comes from you. And it goes, Congress says, we're going to let these agencies handle some portion of this very important stuff. But they're not allowed to do anything else. They can only do what Congress has delegated them authority to do. Now, they break these rules all the time. And that's where Matt Zorn comes in. Um, thank God. It, yeah. And, um, but in general, they have to adhere to, to what, they, what is in their sandbox. And for FDA, that's, that's drugs, the safety and efficacy of drugs for interstate marketing. Um, that does not include psychotherapy. So the question is, how, what do we do with this very interesting novel set of compounds, right, that seem to have this really great therapeutic potential in when they're combined with psychotherapy? And this matters because Remember what Matt was saying about how the tight correlation between the FDA approval of a product and insurance coverage for that product, right? So this, this creates a whole host of interesting legal uh, problems that we're going to watch play out here, you know, shortly before our eyes, and um, we'll hope that Matt's there on the back end to, to sort it all out. Um, I'll just go. Yeah, yeah no, we'll, go ahead. We're running low on time, so please blaze through the rest of them. REMS, anyone heard of REMS? I've heard it like 15 times today already. Um, so REMS is actually one of the places where the FDA can step in and start putting in a some boundaries. Um, it's, it's risk mitigation measures. It's when the FDA, and there's, there's statutory authority, uh, it was enacted, I believe in 2007, for the FDA to basically condition an approval, saying, well, you can prescribe this drug, but in so offering that drug in interstate commerce, you have to do X, Y, and Z. An example would be certification programs, distribution conditions. There's a, it, the picture there, it's a drug called uh, Clozapine. It was uh, actually marketed by Sandoz, one of the original psychedelics company, L LSD, um, Albert Hoffman. Um, and, but this was in the 90s, having to do with the schizophrenia drug. There was uh, a patient monitoring system that FDA required be implemented. That's one of the earliest instances of REMS, so, that, so the FDA can do this. Uh, the takeaway, though, and I'd already heard it here, but I want to emphasize, REMS is supposed to be a program that regulates that safety, helps the FDA uh, make sure that drugs are safe, not that they're efficacious. So when we talk about the assisted psychotherapy, I think you know, many of us can agree that this is something that we would like to see offered with uh, these, these drug products because they might make them more efficacious. But for the purposes of REMS, we really should be focused on the safety component because that's the only thing that there's legal authority for. Um, I'm going to close out these slides with, I, I like to leave audiences whenever we do these talks or with new ideas that we haven't written about elsewhere. And I think today's idea is going to be preemption. So Shane was talking about the difficulty of reconciling state and federal law um, on these issues of automatic rescheduling. And, and there is this legal idea that is being tested outside of psychedelics, which is that the federal law preempts state conflicts of law. This is a basic legal principle that if you all went to law school, don't recommend it. Um, but if you did go to law school, uh, you, you would uh, learn. And it has to do with the supremacy clause. That's why there's a picture of the Constitution. But um, it, the, the basic point here is that if the FDA does something like approve a drug, perhaps the state can't prohibit it. So perhaps when the FDA approves MDMA, all of those uh, existing Schedule One restrictions in the states, uh, maybe we don't have to go through the process of trying state by state to get all of this stuff switched around. And there actually is precedent for it. Um, on this slide, you see there's a drug called Zohydro. It was an opioid, Massachusetts, realizing the opioid epidemic said, we don't want this drug, um, and imposed all sorts of restrictions, never got off the ground because of federal court entered in a preliminary injunction. And what we're seeing this right now with is the abortion pill. Um, a lot of states are trying to impose restrictions, but the FDA, of course, has approved the drug. And so uh, these uh, state laws are getting uh, 
blocked to varying degrees depending on which judge is ruling on the case. So um, that's it for our presentation. Wanted to leave some time for Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us. All right, our first question. If the Lycos version of MDMA is approved for rescheduling, do research into institutions and companies need to source it from Lycos manufacturing? If they want the advantages associated with rescheduling that make research a lot easier, then yes, that that's, would be the study drug they would need to use. Thank you. The next question is, doesn't the REMS statute only allow a REMS for drugs that can cause death or loss of major limbs like chemotherapy drugs? I, I'm not looking at the statute, and I always like to look at it before I answer, but I, I think it's, I don't think that's the way it's, it's written. I think it's, you know, serious, serious risk. Um, I would note, though, that I think one could probably persuasively argue that there might be risk of death um, with some of these compounds. Now, I'm not saying it's significant, but I think you could argue that. Any comment on DEA allowing psilocybin under right to try laws or moving to schedule two? Oh, man. So Matt and I are litigating this issue in the Ninth Circuit and there's right now, and there's simply no way that I can talk about it in a, anything other than an incredibly boring and long-winded way. So I'm going to defer to Matt if you have something to say. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Next the briefs question. are public record. The, the briefs yeah. are public record. We try, we try not to... I'm working on them right now. <laughs> right we, now. We, and, and we're not trying to like deprive, deprive you all of, of an answer here, but we try not to talk about pending cases that we're working on, in part because when you practice before courts, they want you to litigate the case in the courtroom, not out of the courtroom. If so. I could say one thing about it, though, <laughs> one little short thing. Um, we've been through multiple rounds of this litigation. It's, it's been you know, a, real, a real pleasure. Uh, so far. And part of it was we actually petitioned to uh, have psilocybin rescheduled in one phase of this litigation, and DA was like, are you kidding me? And they just like dumped it in the shredder and like said, nice try, guys. And then Matt Zorn went and argued that case in the Ninth Circuit and got that reversed, notching his, what, 29th victory in a row against DEA or something? So... And... and they Thank, thank you, Shane, but I want a special shout out. There, there were a few members of the audience who were there. Hadas was there, Bio was there, Sue was there. So thanks for showing up for, for that argument. It was fun. All right, the next question is, how can it be legal for the same physical substance to be in different schedules depending on who you get it from? The CSA has no such concept. I would agree with that statement um, as a pure theoretical legal matter. Um, I've, I've kind of openly questioned this practice of bifurcated rescheduling, um, and I, I don't think it is not subject to challenge. I will simply say that that is the prevailing practice at this moment in time is to differentiate between the FDA-approved product. I will say that when a generic is approved, typically that generic, an abbreviated new drug application, also gets rescheduled. Um, but um, I, I don't think there is anything in the Controlled Substances Act that supports bifurcated rescheduling. It's simply a practice that I think the field has grown to accept. <laughs> Uh, this is a burning question. Can Lycos limit distribution of MDMA to those who have received MAPS training? That's I double a, dog dare you, Matt. It, it, it's a, um, I, 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 let me put it this way. Um, right now, um, I'm working on a couple competition antitrust cases. It raises interesting antitrust issues. Um, Without knowing the exact facts and circumstances, I wouldn't be able to give a, a good answer either way, but it's a really good question. I mean, the answer is no one knows, I think. No one knows. No, no, no one knows. We haven't really had this type come up. Um, I did have a slide on uh, clozapine. There, there, were, there was a REMS on clozapine um, because a particular drug distribution, uh, drug distribution was required by Sandoz, um, and the FTC filed a lawsuit, a bunch of state attorney generals filed a lawsuit 
and that was quickly undone under antitrust laws. It's not a bad question. Do you have a sense of how New York State will regulate psychotherapists for psychedelic therapy? New York State? Um, I, I don't have any particular insight into New York's you know, approach or, or what they're planning. I would say that I would anticipate that states will do what they do. And you find like in this area, like generally FDA does what FDA does. The states regulate the way they regulate and things tend to march that way until there's some really, really, really compelling reason to shift. So I would anticipate that it will be business as usual unless there is some reason for that to change. Thank you so much, Zane, and Shane, and Matt. Um, there were a lot more questions, so I'm sure people will be finding you. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.